Hello, this is the lecture corresponding to sections 11, 12, and 13 of uh, chapter 16, in which uh, we're going to see what are the reasons behind the existence, how is that we know that there is uh, dark matter, and how is that we know that uh, the universe is expanding. And uh, part of this requires that we measure distances to faraway objects like galaxies. And we're going to review several techniques that are used to determine those uh, distances. We begin in section 11 by looking at um, these, uh, the distribution of uh, uh, speeds that different stars have in four galaxies. Here we have uh, four spiral galaxies, the New Galaxy Catalog 7664 and so on. And uh, these lines correspond to the speeds that the stars have um, as a function of how far they are from the center of the galaxy. So we can see these four curves have similar behaviors. They move up and then they get steady and they continue being steady as they move away from the center. Well, if we had uh, most of the um, of the mass concentrated to towards the center of the galaxy, these uh, lines would drop, um, like in the Kepler case, and uh, for planets. But we don't see that. That means that uh, we don't have all the mass concentrated at the center. There's got to be more mass uh, in uh, extended through the galaxy. And this excess mass simply doesn't uh, shine. We don't see what it is. So for all practical purposes, there, but it's uh, invisible, transparent. And we, we call it uh, dark matter. So this is the argument, the initial argument for the existence of dark matter. Dark matter can be observed, quote-unquote, by gravitational lensing. We have seen this uh, effect before, and basically we have a source that uh, is shining uh, in all directions, and we have an observer. So under normal circumstances, the light coming in this direction would uh, strike the eye, and the person would see the object in the straight direction. But uh, since imagine now that there is some sort of a massive object here, like a galaxy, then um, the light that comes straight towards the observer would be blocked by the galaxy. But it just so happens that the light that comes gracing at the galaxy is going to feel the gravitational pull is going to be banned in this direction. So from the point of view of the observer, the light comes at, an a at this angle and and implies that the object would be here. But the same thing can, can happen on the other side of the galaxy and there would be another image coming from this other side. So bottom line, instead of looking at a single object, we see two and they are identical objects and that is known as gravitational lensing. This is an example in which there is a galaxy that is giving us two images of the same object. Um, this is the same uh, case as before. Here we have um, a galaxy that is lensing another galaxy that is behind it that appears as a ring. It's a blue galaxy. And here we have one, two, three, four galaxies that are lensing, are producing the same effect with uh, something that is blue that is producing now this arc. Continuing, we, we see the same object here and here and here. And we see the same object here, here, here and there. So all of this discussion is to show you that there is something in there that we cannot see that is producing the lensing effect on something that is behind and giving us these uh, images of the same object. 
And this establishes a technique to detect objects that we cannot see. If we manage to see different uh, images of something, but we don't see something in between, that means that it's got to be something dark, dark matter. So lensing can be used to uh, track dark matter. So we have um, a case here in which uh, it was uh, um, the location of the dark matter was obtained by means of this lensing, by looking at the image, identifying objects that are replicated and um, extracting the possible distribution of dark matter that would give you would give us that uh, set of images so in this case the blue is the dark matter and the red is just gas of uh, in between in this region that has over a thousand galaxies This is um, uh, another uh, uh, interesting case in which uh, we have a cluster here colliding with another cluster. Of course, the clusters have uh, stars and have gas, and they are moving one towards the other. As they come in contact, there is a um, separation of uh, gas and uh, dark matter because of the ty different types of friction that they feel as they go across one another. So they get separated and we can still uh, see the cluster, the first cluster here and the second one here, but we begin to see a separation of colors. And later on, we see that part of the cl of cluster two has moved to the front of the blue part that corresponds to the dark matter of cluster two. And the red part, the large part here, uh, is uh, the the actual mass of uh, cluster two. Cluster one also uh, allowed the dark matter to move forward, leaving behind the visible uh, or gas. Eventually, they separate again, and we end up having the gas of the first cluster, and then the dark matter of it in front, and the same in the for cluster two, we have uh, the dark matter in front, separated of the of the gas of cluster two. So this this is the type of effects that uh, occur that we can deduce by looking at the gravitational lensing. This is a computer uh, uh, generated uh, image in which um, the lensing of um, two clusters of galaxies was obtained, was reversed to obtain, to give us the distribution of dark matter. And this is, this filament here is the dark matter that would produce the image that we see here around it. Well, looking at um, the redshift of uh, the superclusters indicate that uh, the universe is expanding. And uh, we're going to run this video by Stephen Hawking, in which uh, we, we're going to hear about the Doppler effect and how uh, the, the redshift introduced, studied by Hubble, take us to the conclusion that the universe is expanding. So now is a good time to be alive, I think. We may only be an advanced breed of monkey, living on a small planet, but we are able to contemplate the universe as a whole, which makes us very special. My goal has always been simple, to work out how the universe works, and why it exists at all. Luckily there are clues everywhere, and the most important one is right above our heads. Examine any patch of the night sky. 
even one as small as the head of a pin, and this is what you'll find. A tiny part of the vast web of galaxies. It's less than a millionth of what we can see of the cosmos from our little planet. But even this tiny sample is enough to find the clue, the key to the past, the present, and perhaps the future too. The clue is that seen from Earth, all these distant galaxies are slightly red in color. They appear almost as if we were looking through rose-tinted glasses. It's this very redness that reveals how the universe was born. And to show you why, I need a straight road and a noisy car. Listen to the sound as it passes by. As the car approaches, the pitch of its engine rises. As it goes away, the pitch of its engine falls. This phenomenon is called a Doppler shift. And the exact same thing happens with light. If our eyes were more sensitive to color, we could see that the car is actually very slightly blue as it approaches. And very slightly red as it goes away. The same rules apply in space. All distant galaxies are slightly red in color. So by the exact same piece of basic physics, they must all be moving away too. In fact, the whole universe is expanding in all directions, getting bigger and bigger, like a balloon inflating. I admit this sounds strange, but to cosmologists, it's like winning the lottery. Because to work out where the universe came from, all we need to do is to stop time and make it run in reverse. Rewind far enough and everything gets closer together. A lot closer together. All the galaxies, in fact every single thing, converges to a single point. The start of everything, 13.7 billion years ago. So it's quite simple, really. Follow the clues, and we can deduce that a very long time ago, the universe simply burst into existence. An event called the Big Bang. Well, after that, now we're going to go and discuss more, a little bit more, uh, Hubble's law. And Edwin Hubble, what he did was to obtain, and we're going to discuss a little bit later, the details. But basically, he obtained the redshift of um, different galaxies. And knowing how far they were from us, he found that there was a correlation between the Doppler shift and the distance. And the farther they are from us, the more Doppler shifted uh, their, their light is, which means they're moving faster. And all of this uh, behaves like uh, the velocity of uh, mass in an explosion, where the velocity is proportional to the distance to, to where the explosion took place. And uh, based on that, he concluded that the universe is uh, expanding. And he found a rule to calculate the relate the the distance how far they are with uh, how move how fast they move, and this is known as the Hubble's law. And there's a constant of proportionality known as a Hubble constant, and it is it is well determined by now, but it still has some uncertainties, 
and in the following section we're going to see how to improve that by improving the measurements of distances. Edwin Hubble was a famed American astronomer of the 20th century. He contributed so much that all sorts of things are named after him. You've likely heard of at least one, probably the most famous one, the Hubble Space Telescope. Although it was launched many years after Hubble's death, the telescope, like its namesake, led to many breakthroughs in the understanding of our universe. Another thing that was named after Hubble is the Hubble Law and Hubble Constant, the subject of our discussion. <coughs> In the early 20th century, Edwin Hubble and Milton Humason observed and measured the distances to a lot of different galaxies. The graph they plotted had a horizontal axis of distance to a galaxy in megaparsecs and a vertical axis of apparent velocity of the galaxy's recession in kilometers per second. When they plotted their observations, they noticed that their points fell along a straight line. Thus, their observations pointed out a direct or linear relationship between the galaxy's velocity of recession and its distance, something known as the Hubble Law. The Hubble Law is telling us that galaxies farther away from us are also moving away faster from us. A galaxy twice as far away is moving away twice as fast. This relationship, the Hubble Law, is shown on screen for you now as an equation. Note how V little r stands for the recessional velocity of a galaxy, D is the distance to the galaxy, and H is the Hubble constant. The average value of the velocity of recession divided by distance is the Hubble constant I just mentioned, and it is now believed to be about 70 to 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec, but we'll use 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec for our lesson. But Well, this is this shows five cases of um, five different um, galaxies, Virgo, Horsa Majoris, etc. And we have here the, the spectrum obtained for Virgo, the spectrum obtained for Ursa Major, etc. And if we look at the lines known as the H and K lines of calcium then we see that they are sitting right here and Virgo well is far but not that far from us but if we go to Ursa Major, Major uh, we see that this line has now moved to here but if we go to Corona Borealis we see that this line is now moved to here and if we go to Boetus we see that the line moves even farther away and in Hydra it goes all the way here so what is this telling us well this telling us that this shift has to do with how fast they are moving with respect with, with respect to us but at the same time this one is more distant from us than this one which is also farther away from us than this one and so on so there's a relationship on how far they are from us and how fast they move away from us. So this is uh, the so-called expansion of the universe. The relationship found uh, by Hubble says that um, galaxies are moving away from us more rapidly than the nearby superclusters. Galaxies in distant superclusters are moving away more rapidly than in nearby superclusters. The motion, this relationship is known as a Hubble flow and the mathematical relationship between the two is known as the Hubble law and that is this one here the speed of how far they mo they're moving away from us is going to be pro proportional to how far they are from us times a constant and this constant nowadays is of the order of 70 is the Hubble constant and we can see it here it would be the slope of this 
curve. This would be the speed or the recessional speed. And this is the distance from us. And uh, the slope, it would be the Hubble constant is 71 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So this is in kilometers per second, the speed, and this distance is in megaparsecs. And uh, the value of 71 is, um, is uh, well contested. As a matter of fact, there are different values, but uh, little by little, uh, different groups have been uh, approaching this uh, average value. But of course, uh, we, we can see that there is some discrepancy with the, with the Hubble law and all of that has to do with how accurate it is our determination of the distance, for instance. And uh, we're going to see methods for determining the distance. And there is uh, also variations coming from the type of object that people use. Like, uh, for instance, we can measure the, the shift, the Doppler shift of stars or nebula or clusters, etc. And of course, they have a, a different uncertainties depending on how well we can see them and how well we can detect the, the Doppler shift. The conclusion of uh, Hubble's expansion, Hubble's flow, is that uh, everything is moving away from us. Would, would that mean that are we at the center of the universe and everything is moving away from us? Well, no, we're not going to fall into that mistake again. And one method to explain this is that all the points in the universe are separating from all the points in the universe. And that can, that can happen in the following uh, scenario, for instance. Imagine that you prepare a uh, chocolate, chocolate chip cake, like this one here, and you put it in the oven. After some time, this, of course, will grow in size, like this. And any two points, so any two uh, chocolate chips that you take will increase their distance as you bake uh, the cake. So this is some sort of an inf inflationary uh, scenario, which is uh, precisely what uh, the name of uh, the theory that explains this uh, has. Well. The accuracy of uh, Hubble's law depends on how well do we determine how far those objects are from us. And there are different um, techniques. In this section, we're going to see uh, three, four techniques to measure those uh, cosmological distances. We need to, to determine the Hubble constant. We need to know, of course, the redshift and the distance. For the distance, we need to observe the objects and usually the the objects that will give us the distance that for which we we're allowed to find the distances are uh, the cephites in which uh, we can just calculate the period and the period is can be used to obtain the distance but um not only that we can also do it through supernova and uh, globular clusters etc there are different techniques used to measure uh, distances for different different objects, and uh, for galaxies, uh, there is this technique known as the Tully-Fisher relation, which is a very interesting one. But um, it is because of the difficulties in finding th that distance that we cannot know exactly that h zero is exactly seventy one kilometers per second per megaparsec. Bottom line, we have these four techniques in which the spectroscopic parallax allows you to calculate something up to 33,000 uh, light years and this is a spectroscopic parallax it's not parallax parallax is going to be much smaller than this now the variable stars would allow you to calculate the distances anywhere between 330,000 all the way to 100 million light years depending on the type of uh, variable star that you're looking at and the Tully Fisher method would allow you to go all the way to 10,000 million light years. Let us review these uh, in turn. The Tully Fisher method is very interesting because um, it, it is based 
on the light produced by the gas in the in, in a galaxy the gas as we know produces the um, uh, radio waves the 21 centimeter wavelength coming from hydrogen and um, this of course is going to be doppler shifted as the as the um, galaxy moves away from us but since the galaxy is rotating light coming from the left edge of the galaxy is going to be doppler shifted in one direction and light coming from the other end the right hand side of the galaxy is going to be doppler shifted in the opposite direction so there's going to be because of that we're going to have a doppler shift coming from the motion of the galaxy but at the same time it's going to be blurred by the doppler shift created by the rotation of the galaxy which changes the velocity of uh, of the gas at the edges of the galaxy so that will introduce um, a broadening of the 21 centimeter line and that broadening has to do with um, the luminosity of the galaxy with the size and luminosity of the galaxy which allows us to calculate find the mag the distance the absolute magnitude and then the distance of how far it is from us and we're going to see this uh, my friend with a bow tie explain this welcome to electron line and Welcome to Electron Line, and now we're going to take another look at how they determined the accuracy of the Hubble constant. Remember, Hubble was way off, probably by a factor of seven or eight, where he thought that the Hubble constant was in the 500 range, 500, 550 kilometers per second per mega per sec, which we now know today is completely wrong, of course. But the concept was there that there was this re linear relationship between the recessional velocities of galaxies and the distance from, uh, to those galaxies. So, if the galaxy was twice as far away, it was moving twice as fast, three times as far away, it was moving three times as fast. But how do we find an independent way of measuring the distance to those galaxies? Well, back in 1977, Tully Fisher, or Brent Tully and Richard Fisher, came up with this ingenious concept where they had studied the spin-flip radiation coming from galaxies. Now, what does a spin-flip mean? Well, it turns out that electrons have various quantum mechanics states in which they can exist inside the atom. And one of those quantum mechanics states is what we call the spin flip, where an electron can basically be what we call spin up or spin down. It's a quantum mechanics state in relation to the electromagnetic fields inside the atoms that cause electrons to be oriented one way or the other way in terms of the angular momentum and in terms of the electrical uh, forces due to the attractive and repulsive forces due to the charges. And so we can then measure that radiation. It turns out that the photons emitted when the spin flip like that occurs, if it, if the, uh, remember that there's the possibility of having two electrons in a single orbital, and if the two electrons are in the same direction, then they have, uh, in the same direction, then they have a, a uh, what we would call a less stable state and if they're in opposite directions. So the electrons can spin like that and when they do they release a certain amount of energy equivalent to a 21 centimeter long wavelength of radiation which is kind of between radio radiation and microwave radiation. That radiation is able to make it through the dust and nebulas inside galaxies so it's an easily measured uh, radiation and what they found was that the larger the galaxy, the more luminous the galaxies are, the more that line is spread wide. So for large galaxies, we have the line that spreads out very thick, and so we have a very wide spreading of that line. And for smaller galaxies that are less luminous, the line is much narrower. Of course, those things are hard to measure, but nevertheless, they realized that there was this linear relationship. And because of that, they were able to then determine the distance of galaxies in an independent fashion. And they utilized that to come up with a more accurate form of the Hubble constant, the Hubble equation here. And when they went through all their calculations, they found that in their estimation, the Hubble constant was somewhere between 80, oh, not 80, uh, between, yes, between 80 to 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now notice, that when Hubble came up with his constant, it was around 500 or 550. With, uh, with uh, Thule and Fisher, 
we were able to narrow that down to between 80 and 100. Still not correct because today we know that it's much closer to 73 than it is to those numbers. But it was a nice improvement, an independent way of trying to measure the Hubble constant accurately. Simply that simple observation saying, wow, look at that. For large galaxies with a lot of luminosity, this line is very much spread out. For small galaxies, it's much more confined to a single, to a narrow area. And when they found that linear relationship, they were able to turn that into a more accurate value for the distance of galaxies. Very nice, but wasn't good enough yet. So we had to come up with even better independent ways. The bottom line of all of this is that the greater the galaxy mass, in other words, the, the larger the galaxy, the greater its size. And depending on how big it is, the gas on different parts of the galaxy is going to be moving at different uh, speeds. But uh, the greater the size, the larger the, the, ra the range of uh, speeds from one edge to the other edge. So the more rapidly the stars and gas rotate, the greater the range of speeds. And consequently, the greater the range of the Doppler shift is going to be. So this, uh, the width, the 21 centimeter line is not going to be a line, it's going to be a blur. And the width of that blur is going to be related to the absolute luminosity. So knowing the absolute luminosity and the apparent luminosity can allow us to calculate the distance. Another technique is by looking at supernova, type 1a supernova. Well, type 1a supernova has the characteristic that uh, we know how, they, how uh, it happens. And because of that, we know that it's uh, all the time is going to go to uh, minus 19 in absolute magnitude. So if we see a supernova, then we, we can be sure that the absolute magnitude is uh, negative 19. But we also have the apparent magnitude and with the apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude, we can determine the distance. This nice picture shows two supernova happening at the same time in this galaxy, this uh, spiral galaxy, the NGC 664. And um, it's a rare case in which there are two supernovas back to back. The other method is the spectroscopic uh, parallax. For this one, you would have to look at a, at a galaxy, and there you have to look at a main sequence star, look at the spectrum, and determine the spectral type. So it's going to be uh, an M or uh, O, etc. And with that, knowing that it's an O, for instance, or a B or an M, and knowing that it's a main sequence star, then it can be placed on the HNR diagram. And once that we have it on the HNR diagram, we can extract from there the absolute luminosity. And that, along with the apparent luminosity, will give us uh, the information needed to obtain the distance. So this can be done for uh, stars that are up to 32,000 light years away. Summarizing of all for all these uh, techniques, we have the spectroscopic parallax right here. We have the Thule Fisher method, looking at the broadening of the 21 centimeter line right here. Looking at the variables, we have this long range of possibilities. And the type 1a supernova, the ones that go all the way to negative 19, right here. On top of all of this, we have uh, the normal parallax, which allows you only to go up to a few light years, uh, 326 light years. So all these techniques allow us to calculate the distance, uh, determine how far the objects are from us, and use that distance to uh, find the Hubble's constant, h sub zero. Well, these are the questions that you would be answering in class. I recommend that you study them because you, you're going to see them in a quiz coming your way.